Hey fans, this is Deborah Lynn Gordon, better known as Ghoul of Your Dreams. Now, I was a zombie in George Romero's Dawn of the Dead, but I was the lead female zombie in Day of the Dead. And you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. Rigor mortis is beginning to set in. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming yet another zombie from George Romero's 1985 cult classic Day of the Dead celebrating its 35th anniversary, Jeff Monahan. Uh, Jeff was a zombie in the movie. And uh, he worked with Romero in a couple other films later in his career, The Dark Half, um, Bruiser. Uh, he also worked with John Sayles in the Western movie Lone Star. And um, he also uh, made some of his own movies like Spree and Hits, which is a mob movie. And then he directed George Romero's um, anthology series Dead Time Stories. And it's going to be great to have him on the show today. We're going to talk about all that stuff. And I can't wait. We're on the verge of Halloween. One of my favorite times of the year. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Jeff Monahan. Hello. Hey, Jeff. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? Thanks, I'm very well. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. This is a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, sure. Thanks for asking me. Absolutely. So, going back in time, I was reading that uh, before movies, uh, you were a police officer. Was law your original trajectory? Yeah, I had uh, decided at a fairly young age that I wasn't going to be happy working in an office or a factory, and uh, I thought that police work would be very interesting, and uh, so I got into that and did that for a few years and really, really enjoyed it, uh, and it has a dark side to it. You're just seeing people at their worst all the time, and so I had I had done it for a few years, went through the police academy and all that, worked as an undercover officer and uh, in the detective division as well as in uniform, but I was working with a guy who was about to retire, and he was uh, uh, divorced and alcoholic, and he said, kid, it's like the Army, you get in, do a couple of years, and get out. And I thought, yeah, that's good. Uh, so I left that, and I had thought about acting. I think a lot of people think about, oh, I want to be an actor. But after my undercover work, I thought, well, you know, I was... I was acting, doing that, and maybe I can give that a shot. So that's sort of the trajectory of that. Uh, I'm sure with what's going on in the news today, you're glad that you got out. <laughs> yeah, it's so it's so tragic, and I see both sides of it. And but I do think that police work and police training has changed considerably since I did it. I, I, I think there's a there's a lack of good recruitment, of good training, of good retraining, of good counseling, and all that. I still believe that. The vast majority of police officers are are professional and doing a really fabulous job, but I do think that uh, because of those uh, fallings off of certain professional standards, uh, some things uh, have happened that kind of have diminished uh, the profession. I've seen police officers do things not only on the news, which are like, wow, that's wrong, uh, but I've seen, I've seen police officers pull over a car and do it in a way that, like, no, that's not safe. What are you, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, so uh, it's uh, hopefully this will turn things around that being a police officer is going to be taken uh, more seriously from the top and recruitment and training will uh, get back to the standards that I think used to be better. Exactly. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, when Giuliani was mayor of New York, I mean, things, you know, cleaned up for a while, you know, after mm -hmm. a while and stuff. I just hope yeah, I, the whole world can be like that soon. Eventually. <laughs> But uh, did you gravitate towards film at an early age at all? I love the idea of movies, and, and I, I'm of such an age that when I was coming up, you do you do theater, uh, and the whole idea of doing a movie was out of the question. I mean, movies were like huge Panavision cameras and you know, weigh 800 you know tons, and you know it's just like this big, uh, unobtainable thing. I did a little, a uh, few things, uh, 
like uh, at a public access station. But the whole idea of a camera was like, ooh, scary. And now it's sort of like flipped because I, I teach acting as well as do it now. And, and a lot of students are like, they're making little movies with their cell phones. They're kind of used to the whole concept of being on camera and playing it back and seeing what they look like, but they haven't done stage. So it's like it's sort of kind of reversed itself a little bit. I think it's best to uh, uh, really be trained in theater since it's you out there for two hours or whatever it is, and you're you're out there on the wire, you know, as they say, and uh, so it gives you a great amount of confidence. But initially, I liked the idea of movies, but never really thought it was going to be a possibility until I got into it more. Yeah, did any movies influence you at all? A lot, a lot of them. <laughs> uh, I grew up, I was very shy, and I watched uh, Chiller Theater every Saturday night with Bill Cardell, Laurie Cardell's father. Uh, so I grew up, like, uh, loving horror films, but I watched a lot of different kinds of movies, and one thing that I think was kind of better for that at that time, we had less variety to choose from. So you, know, you just had like three stations and PBS, which nobody counted. You know, it was like, oh, Mr. Rogers. But otherwise, I'm, you know, if I'm in the mood to watch a movie, well, what's on Friday night at 9 o'clock? That's what I'll watch if I'm going to watch anything. So I was exposed to a lot of different types of movies, different genres, comedies, dramas, everything. And even like silent films. It was uh, actually on PBS. They had a thing where they would play silent silent films once a week. And so I saw a whole bunch of things and uh, I, I was very influenced a lot uh, by them. Uh, but I think the, the, my my uh, big love growing up was, was horror movies and House on Haunted Hill and all the classic um, uh, universal films from the 30s and 40s, Frankenstein and Dracula and the Wolfman and all that. Uh, I just loved all those. But I got to see, you know, Cool Hand Luke and, you know, everything else that was around, too. Go going to see Bonnie and Clyde, I saw at the drive-in. I was pretty young, but that was like... I remember I would get excited. My legs would stick straight out, you know, and I remember yeah. Foggy Mountain Breakdown, the banjo uh, thing in that, and it was just... Just really, uh, really exciting. Yeah. And then you said you worked uh, for a cable access station. What was that like? Was that one of those, like, volunteer in internships? Yeah, I didn't work there. There was a guy I knew I saw. I, I was doing theater, and I saw an ad posted probably at the theater saying, hey, we need somebody for, like, these little little movies we're making. And I went over and met this guy, and he he made little, he, he, would, he would say, I make little videos. And, <laughs> and uh, he, he, he just wanted to do it for fun, and I wanted to have some on-camera experience. And he would write these little comedic uh, uh, bits and film noir spoofs and things. And so it was kind of an interesting uh, dip into like, okay, this is a camera and now we'll get soundish. Oh, okay, I get to wear a mic and I can't move this way. Okay, and I got to be in the light and, you know, just playing around and learning on the street, literally. You know, we shot things on the streets or in the studio there. Just And it was just... Uh, him goofing on things with his camera, but I, it was me trying to use it as a learning process, uh, which which was quite fun. Yeah, I remember back in the day, you could basically create anything you wanted on cable access. Now everything in 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 whatever towns that are left of it, it's all educational crap. <laughs> for kids. Yeah, yeah. Now it's it, it's political and talking heads and this issue and that issue. But in those days, I mean, he would make his little movies, and I'm sure a lot of people would like tune in and maybe tune right out again. I don't know, but it was you it, it, it had such freedom to go off and make anything that. That you wanted, and uh, you know, within guidelines of you know ratings or whatever would be acceptable. But uh, he did a wide variety of things, and it was just uh, fun to fun to work with him and fun to uh, learn from it. Oh, that's cool. So, in the midst of of that and uh, being a police officer, how does Day of the Dead come into your life? I had been. Uh, doing theater and uh, I heard they were casting Day of the Dead and I went, I, I was very brazen, I was stupid as just completely naive about all of it and uh, untalented and just what I just I, I felt like I didn't know anything really but I, I was just 
brazenly would, would do things. And I walked into 247 Fort Pitt Boulevard, uh, which was Laurel Entertainment, and mm. I said, you're casting, I wanna, uh, can I audition? And this very kind lady uh, was there, and she was casting, and she said, okay, uh, here, read for this. And she gave me the, the part of Steel <laughs> to read. And I was like 20-whatever years old, like skinny and just the, the most anti-Steel yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it was like some sh I'm shooting a machine gun and screaming profanities at zombies I'm blowing to pieces or, you know, whatever. <laughs> and I just jumped in and did it. And she said, okay, you can be a zombie. <laughs> It's like, oh, okay. But I was thrilled. And then I went the first day to the Wampum Mines there, and I did it. And it was like the first day, I was like way down this passage where we're all coming up to try to get uh, Lori and the, the gang is uh, uh, we're kind of closing in on them. And we're trying to get there quickly to eat them, but I'm trying to get there quickly so I can get closer to the camera. Um, but... Uh, at the end of the day, uh, she asked me, would you like to come back as a featured zombie? I was like, sure. And so that's how I got to do what uh, Chris Romero called the character Broccoli Man, uh, which never ended up being uh, listed in it. But it was uh, Howard Berger did the makeup, <laughs> uh, who was so nice and gracious, and uh, it was so much fun to do. And then he said afterwards it was one of his favorite makeups of the movie, and we were taking photos, he had taken, taken pictures of it, and he and I together, and he couldn't just like send it from phone to phone in those days. He said, when I get back to LA, I'll send you some prints of, of the pictures. And I thought, yeah, sure you will, you know, yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> but uh, you know, a couple of weeks after they wrapped, I get an envelope in the mail with pictures uh, from the shoot, uh, which was like really, really nice of him. Yeah, were, were you a fan of the other Romero films? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I loved Night of the Living Dead, and I was dating the woman who eventually became my wife when we saw Dawn of the Dead. Went to see that, and uh, we just laughed and had such a great time. It was it was yeah. uh, fantastic. And then I took her home afterwards, and I had bought her at some point a large blue teddy bear. And in the middle of the night, she woke up and looked into the face of this large blue teddy bear after seeing that movie and screamed. And her mother swore she would never date me again because I was corrupting her. <laughs> yeah, but I was a big, big fan of that, yeah. Yeah, I, I, Dawn of the Dead's my favorite, you know, and I watch it every yeah. Halloween. Yeah, I, uh, this one has actually grown on me a lot more in, in recent years. I, I didn't like it for a long time for the same reason a lot of people didn't like it. Um, it was too dark, there was too much tension, you know. But I think in hindsight, this was his last great movie. I mean, you you know, you did d The Dark Half and Bruiser with him. I mean, I think that the studio system kind of, you know, clouded his vision a little bit. I mean, when you were working on those movies, did you see any tension between him and the producers? No, I didn't, but I heard stories about Land of the Dead when he was doing that. They, I think they ended up taking $5 million out of the budget while they were shooting, and he had to keep rewriting the script every night. And so it, it was he was trying to maintain this vision that he had, that if people in, in the producerial uh, uh, department would have trusted it, he had proven himself already, but it became more about the numbers and money and projections and... And, uh, being run oftentimes by people who really didn't know what they were doing. And when he would get a good producer, like on, on Bruiser, he had Ben Barinholtz and Peter Grunwald. And Peter is fantastic to work with. And uh, Ben Barinholtz did like the Coen Brothers movies and you know, Barton Fink and things. And so Ben was uh, really, really uh, allowing him to you sort of have free reign to do things and to try things. That was more of an experimental thing on, on that for his part. But Ben was really nice. I, I did, a, I did a, a scene, one of the scenes I did in that, Ben Barinholtz came up afterwards or in the midst of takes and like complimented me about my acting. And I was like, wow. And it was like, everybody was like joining together to, uh, you know, to make something. But I think what happened was uh, some of the some of the projects later on, he just didn't have the budget that he needed to tell the story he wanted to tell, and was trying to make stuff, but under restrictions that should never have 
existed. And I agree with you also about like dawn and verse dawn versus day. It was something that grew on me more uh, as the years went by because and dawn's still my favorite. But it was initially I think I didn't have the sense in that film of the claustrophobia since we don't know how big a mine is. You know, you know how big yeah. a farmhouse or a mall is, so you sort of feel like, oh my god. There's the walls. That's it. That's all you got. All you got with with the mine. I think you sort of felt more amorphous freedom around. You're like, well, I don't know how big it is. I could run that way. You know. Yeah. I, I talked to Christine, and she told me that by the time he was doing the Night of the Living Dead remake, bitterness was starting to creep in, and he was just a, a different guy, which is sad to see such a talented genius fall apart like that, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, and it's really, and he had so much, so much talent, and he was so humble about it, and he knew so many things. I was at his apartment in, in uh, Toronto uh, in his later years, and yeah. we were out on the balcony, just the two of us, and I don't know why I, I did it, but maybe overlooking, you know, the Esplanade from a high vantage point. But I started doing the, the opening monologue of Richard the Third. You know, like now is the winter of our discontent. And he jumped right in, mm -hmm. and we both stood there on the balcony doing Shakespeare, <laughs> and he knew it. <laughs> and it was like, "You're so cool," <laughs> you know. Yeah. But it, it's it's a it's a tough you know the whole Hollywood system is it's just you have to prove yourself and bend over backwards every time out of the gate and you're often asking for permission from people that you know a lot more about it than they do you know yeah but George wasn't a guy who was going to conform to Hollywood standards. No, no. I mean, I think he always, as an artist, he always had a vision of what he wanted to do. So, I mean, I think it would have been so easy for him uh, to step into uh, things that other filmmakers, uh, John Carpenter, whomever, would, would go, okay, I'm going to take the paycheck and I'm going to make this thing. And it's a typical Hollywood you know, it's a scary movie. Okay, good. And we'll get the teenagers in on Friday night to, you know, um, at, uh, for box office and everything. But it wasn't, you know, always art. I mean, I think Carpenter did some great films, but I think George never, he never compromised his vision. I think he was just compromised from the other side, not being able to be allowed to fulfill it in, in some of those later films. Exactly. Uh, how, how was working on The, the Dark Half? Working on the Dark Half was really uh, fun. Uh, uh, Timothy Hutton was a little bit uh, much <laughs> different <laughs> trying to get in. And, uh, you may have heard horror stories about him, but uh, hopefully he's uh, calmer <laughs> now. Yeah. But he had a very tough uh, he had a very tough assignment uh, with that one. But I remember sitting on the stairs and just talking to Amy Madigan, who was just a sweetheart, and uh, it was uh, just really fun diving in and doing those doing those things so it was it was a, an enjoyable process it always was with him he was it was like i say it was a big family and it, you didn't feel like he was uh, asking anything of you that you couldn't uh, not only do but have fun doing and he was very and uh he was just laughing and having a good time and getting the shot and great and that was great let's do it great let's do it great <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. Did you interact at all with uh, Ritanya Alda? No, I just did the scene. The only thing I did in that was uh, the scene with Amy and uh, Timothy Hutton. It was just like one little uh, bit in it. But uh, I'd read the book um, and uh, read most of the Stephen King books that have ever been written. So that was kind of also another thing like, hey, it's a Stephen King project, too. Yeah. Wasn't Bruiser his first uh, Canadian production? Yeah, I believe so. Uh, he had wanted to do that, uh, and there were these restrictions about casting. I wasn't sure how it was going to go with it. Uh, I ended up getting cast in Land of the Dead, which was, they were even stricter, and the percentage of cast had to go so much Canadian, and I, so I, I ended up like losing the part in Land to someone who was... Canadian, although I think there's somebody named Monaghan, a character in Land of the Dead, which was nice of him. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, when he went to uh, Canada, Bruiser was that uh, sort of an uh, initial film up there, and he got a lot of flack, uh, or some some flack, or some you know potential flack uh, from uh, 
doing that his way. And I remember I was around for a lot of that in the, in the production office up there. Um, somebody was saying, you know, we got you got to make it bloodier, and you got to do this, and you got to make it that, because you know you're George Romero, and people want to see you know gore. And he was like, mm, no. <laughs> you know, he was just he was doing that his way, and he just wanted to. Uh, uh, tell that story without having to like subscribe to a preconceived notion of what he's going to do. It's George Romero. It's going to be my need intestines, you know? No. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. How, how, Oh, by the way, how long did it take to put on the makeup in day of the dead? I don't remember it being really, really long. I mean, it was uh, involved enough. They ran outside. He had somebody run outside. There was lichen uh, growing outside the building, the, the green stuff. And he's like, go grab me some of the lichen. And, and so they started applying uh, applying that. It may have taken an hour and a half or it was something fairly short. It could have been two hours. But uh, it, was, it wasn't that long that you would say, wow, that, that took all day. I mean, sometimes you do things. I, I did corpse singing. It was like five hours, you know. Uh, initially, that started because we were just working with a smaller budget and a uh, less experienced crew, and, and just you had to, like, take more time and try things, and, okay, that's falling off, okay. But we're Howard, uh, they really knew what they were doing. Although he did make me nervous, I, I must say, at one point. Um, there was a squib hit with that being shot in the head, and in the forehead under the latex piece, uh, that it was covering the forehead area, uh, there was a charge of uh, gunpowder that yeah. obviously would be put there and facing out so that when they blow it, the hole appears. And after they had the makeup just about done, uh, Howard said to uh, the person he was working with, uh, did, we, did we put the gunpowder, did we put it facing the right way? <laughs> because otherwise it would be facing in, into my head. And I'm laying there, you know, I'm like, I don't have any experience with this. And I'm like, my eyes, I'm sure, were darting from side to side. And they're like, I think I have, I think it's going to blow out, not in. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but I'm like panicking, like if it goes off, I'm going to really blow my head off. And then they just laugh because they were just pulling my leg the whole time. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, ah, thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Never a dull moment on a movie set. No. <laughs> no. And I didn't even know I was in, like, some sort of special features until, like, last year somebody sent me a clip of I was just sitting on a couch as somebody was being interviewed. But I was, like, the zombie sitting on a couch between the two of them. I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot all about that. Yeah. But everybody was just, you know, just so gracious and nice. And I was, I could have been so nervous and things just being around uh, all this after, you know, theater is a very different world in some ways. But it was just so comfortable it was like you just fall right into it and it's just like a uh, a fun experience yeah. you also worked with uh, john sales on lone star yeah how was that experience that was phenomenal uh that was just so wonderful i had just done a, f a film an independent film in new york and i was uh had uh, my agent sent me in to uh meet with av kaufman and i read for the part and then i got a call back from uh john to go in and meet with him and the producers and and uh it was just uh so I was, it, what a cast it was like you know with, with McConaughey and Chris Christopherson and every McConaughey was just about to hit actually but I mean Clifton James from Cool Hand Luke and oh, yeah. all these all, Elizabeth Pena who was wonderful uh, Chris Cooper and it was really kind of a different experience for me because I had done like indie films and things you're kind of faking this for that we had we had shot one film in uh, uh, South Jersey that doubled for Texas because we didn't have the money to go to Texas but in Florida star it's like everything's real you know and i remember the first night i arrived on the set i walked down the end and uh, uh it was like okay the mexicans are coming across the rio grande you know and then i said well, where's the real rio grande it's like that is the real rio grande it's like oh yeah you know <laughs> but it was it was great uh great fun doing it and uh uh, really, I love the I love the movie. I think it's it's uh, such a classic, uh, and the script is so intelligent. and And John, uh, John, and Chris Christopherson used to sit around and talk politics. And I, I, 
and I, I would like that to a certain extent, but after a while, it was see, they were getting into the contras and all sorts of like things going on. Like, oh, I'm going to jump in the pool and swim for a while. <laughs> but, um, but, but the whole experience is like being in the place that you were supposed to be in. Um, we went to Mexico, Mexico, which was like right on the border. Went to bullfight. That bullfight, which uh, <laughs> I don't want to do that again. Um, but uh, just driving around Mexico and going around uh, the area, it was just uh, really. I, I'm so grateful for that experience. It was a great, uh, great honor to be part of that. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, Chris Christopherson went to the same high school that me and my whole family went to, San Mateo High School. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's, a, he's a great guy and lots of interesting stories. There was one shot that we had to drive into and we're sitting in the, in the police car and we're up the road from where we're going to be driving into the shot. So as it took them time to set and reset and reset and all that. We'd sit there and he would tell me stories about making, you know, the sailor who fell from grace with the sea oh, and yeah. like different, different movies he'd done. And it was just, uh, it was fun hanging out with him. And I also learned kind of a big lesson acting wise. Uh, I was sitting outside the honey wagon trailers that we had on my steps one day and we had shot the previous day and uh, he was great i mean it's great and he came out of his trailer and he said to me the black dog of depression visited me again last night and i was like what what, what what's wrong he said, oh man I'm, I'm not an actor i can't i can't do this and i was like no man you're really good you know so we all have those doubts that we don't you know, we don't think that we're you know we're hitting it but he was just so good but it was like yeah we're all we all get that we all get that but trust yourself you know because he was just really really uh amazing and matthew was like the most positive person i think i've ever met in my life you know because it was like 106 degrees and you have the typical you know uh variances of making a film and matthew was always like smiling and joking and having a good time and just you know totally upbeat it was like wow who is this guy yeah. So it was a lot of fun getting to know him and hang out. And Gabe Cassius, uh, uh, the, the four of us, uh, hang out together. And Gabe was wonderful as well. Yeah, I can't Chris believe. And Elizabeth and just, just it was a, it's just a fun, fun group. Yeah, I can't believe Chris Christopherson would say he's no actor. To me, he's the best actor <laughs> out of the whole um, Highwaymen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he was so good. And it was just like, it's just one of those things as an actor, you, you want the confidence that... I'm doing this, I can do this, I know what I'm doing, I know that the work's good, I know that, you know, I, 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 I trust, I, tr I, can, I, I trust myself. And if you get that little glimmer of like, oh man, I suck, oh, I shouldn't be doing this, it just sort of taints everything. And you just need that, that kick in the pants, you know, once in a while saying, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, so I always tell people, I, I've taught acting for directors, and a lot of, I always tell like director uh candidates or students or directors uh, that I've met, like, you know, one kind word to an actor, you're going to get such a better performance because they can now trust and let it go and, and stop worrying about it and just do it, you know? Mm -hmm. What, what made you transition into uh, writing and directing? Well, I was in New York, and it was like the typical cliche. It's like like Tootsie or something. Everything you've ever uh, ever heard of, of. I had done like six or seven years of professional work, theater. I was in Equity. I was in SAG and After and all that. And I moved to New York, and crickets. I mean, nothing. Nobody would. Nobody would talk to me. I couldn't get an agent. Couldn't it was get arrested. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't get arrested. Nothing was. Nothing was happening. And uh, I I ran into a friend. Uh, uh, one day at the SAG office, who I'd done a play with back in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. and uh, he, I say, hey, you know, what's going on? And we're talking, and he said, we're, I'm going to do this little showcase um, play that you don't get paid for those. You basically waive your equity rights, but you want agents and casting people to come. And he said, it, 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 weirdly enough, coincidentally, it's called Lone Star. It's an entirely different script written by a guy named James McClure. And I had read it, and I loved it, and I said, oh my God, I'd love to, love to do that. And my friend says, um, he said, well, me and uh, this other guy, we're, we're playing the brothers, but we're auditioning on Monday for the third guy. And I said, yeah, I, I'd love to come in and do that. And he said, well, my friend works for Al Pacino. And he said, why don't you come up to Al's office and read? I'm like, 
okay. <laughs> you know, so I go up, and uh, I was the first person they saw that day. And uh, Luke Tome is the guy that works for Al, and he said, that was it. You came in, you did it. I, that's, we saw people the rest of the day. I just, like, remembered you. So I got the part in that. And we did a couple of plays that Luke was producing, and nobody was coming. You know, you did the showcase, mm -hmm. not getting paid. Al would come. Brooke Shields would come. Like, different people like that would come. But no agents were showing up. No, it was like, you know, it's small, audio, uh, small uh, house, small theater, and... Uh, you know, six people would be out there. And, they, they, you know, so we really didn't uh, achieve that goal. But uh, Luke kept wanting to pr produce more plays. And I said, well, if we would do a movie, if I, you know, we could do a movie, then maybe nobody would see it initially, but we'd always have it. You know, we could show it to people. We could sit them down and say, here, look at this. And so... Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote this script. Uh, we were talking about the story. He and I talked the, talked the story through a bit. And I just knocked this script out in six days. And we went to Al to get the money. And we did a reading for him. And uh, Al said that he wanted to direct it. Yeah. Which, uh, on the upside, is like, that's fabulous. On the downside, he had been doing this thing called The Local Stigmatic, which he was in editing on for years because he was kind of toying with it and things, and we just kept seeing different cuts of the film, and it was a really, really uh, interesting film. It's really good. But we weren't sure if it would definitely happen. You know, he might get busy, and we weren't, we weren't sure how long it would take. But we had done this reading for him, and there were a bunch of people came to the reading. It was at Al's Loft, and uh, a bunch of producers came. And so Nancy Tannenbaum from Sex, Lies, and Videotape, she was there. She offered us a deal. Um, John Panotti uh, was there, producer. I did Hell or, uh, Hell, uh, Hell or High Water a couple years ago. Wonderful guy. He offered us a deal. And another guy who was partnered with Martin Sheen, he offered us a deal. So we just took the deal with the most money, <laughs> and we ended up making making the film. Uh, so, but I really like the process of writing. I, I I found out. I discovered it was sort of like a time tunnel. You just start writing, and you just forget yourself. And hours and hours and hours go by, and it's so much fun. Uh, I, for me, I just really really enjoyed it. So I thought, well. Luckily, I, these two interests I have, acting and writing, kind of go together. I'll just write things, and some things I'll maybe I'll there'll be a part in it for me, you know. Yeah. So uh, I've I've uh, just really enjoyed both. They're sort, of like, sort of like different parts of your brain, but they're both fun. Yeah, I remember I saw hits one time uh, years ago. I was um, uh, renting from this this video store that had literally everything and i was going through a period where i wanted to see everything that martin sheen was in um he, he must have been great to work with yeah he was phenomenal because there were so many things that there were films, there were so many changes to the script and changes to the casting ideas and things like that and i and uh, luckily i had a we had a baby during the process because it would have been so stressful otherwise so my focus was more on the priority of like hey and i'm having a kid uh, uh, but martin when he came in he was again so complimentary uh, uh, about things and he loved the script and uh, all that and it was so nice of him to, to be in it uh, with us. And I remember it was one scene that takes place in the restaurant kitchen uh, where he's kind of giving us the assignment and this is what you're going to do and bing, bing, bing. And he and I are standing like six feet from where we need to be on either side of this counter. And Jim's down at the other end of the counter and Luke's at the other end of the counter and we should be down there too. But he's telling me this story. And they're like setting up and they're ready to go and they start calling, you know, uh, you know okay, we're rolling, speed, and I, we should be over there, but he's just telling this story and action. And on action, boom, he just walks over and he slips right into his New Yorkies and he, you know, we just did it. And he's brilliant. So he could just go for the last second and just turn around and like, be there and I was so impressed I, and he's such a such a nice guy uh, he's uh, really gracious and uh, we had we had my first child my daughter uh, during the shoot and took her to the set and uh, he was he put his hand on her head and said oh, bless you <laughs> he was just a nice guy yeah <laughs> and one of my heroes too it was like and at the beginning of that year the, we shot that in like November at the beginning of that year I had no money I had no agents 
I had no hope. <laughs> I had <laughs> nothing. And when we found out we were going to have a baby, it was like I had actually told Luke, I said, I'm going to move back to Pennsylvania and work at a factory or job. I don't, I got to give it up because I need to support a family now. And uh, Luke was, you know, we were best pals. And he's like, give it another six months. Give it another six months. Like, mm. And by November, I had more money in the bank than I'd ever had. I, I was signed with William Morris and Ambrosio Mortimer as my agents. I was making a movie with one of my idols, <laughs> from, you know, Apocalypse <laughs> Now and all these things. And I thought, wow, it's really... It turns that fast. So when people say, oh, I'm really depressed, like, you know, tomorrow's another day. You don't know what's coming. You know, so things get bad, and you know, it's, a, it's a lousy profession for security, but it turns on a dime, you know. So keep keep persistent. Wow, that's awesome. How, how did um, a date, uh, Dead Time Stories come about? We had written this, uh, I had written this thing called House Call. We wanted to do a show called Tom Savini's Chill Factor. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we were going to shoot an episode and see how that went and see if we could get any any interest on it. And we tried to raise money. It took a long, long, long time, and we couldn't get people to give us money for uh, forever. Marty Schiff and I uh, were trying to do that. And finally, we got enough money to shoot this, uh, this one episode, House Call, and Tom directed it, and Tom was phenomenal. He went off and locked himself in a hotel room for a motel room for a week and did storyboards and things. And I think that film, it's like 30 minutes long or so, you could freeze frame that film at any point, and it's a beautiful picture. It just, it's, he told such a visual story, and Bingo O'Malley, one of my favorite, we had done plays together and things, mm-hmm. um, was, and it, it was just really a good process. But nothing ever happened to it. Nobody wanted to make Tom Savini's show factors. Uh, and after a few years, uh, I was uh, talking to Chris Romero and and uh, different people about trying to make some sort of series. And somebody at some point said, "Well, if there's George's name on it, then you could you, people would be interested." And so that was the good thing. And we all went off and made more stories. And I wrote them. So that was all the good stuff. The bad stuff was we had uh, very uh, contentious producers on that. Uh, Marty and I were on it, but we had a couple other guys who would fight a lot. <laughs> and it was just, it was kind of a nightmare of, of the, the entire thing. It really became very, very difficult um, shooting and sort of the opposite of George or John Sales or almost every set I've ever been on because you felt tension on the set and yelling and screaming and things some of the time before because of these two other producers who were, one of them's passed away and the other one hopefully is, has calmed down. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, at that time, they were, it was just wasn't fun. And so it's always the typical writer lament to say, you know, I wrote this and, you know, that's what got made and it, it's not what I meant. And so I really wasn't happy with most of the other stories that we put together. And so the idea was that we were going to make uh, two well, we did the first film, and we got uh, distribution for that, and then we got funding from the Bank of Hawaii to make the second film, and uh, which was odd, but okay. So then we did the second film, and one of the producers who was very contentious uh, never finished his episode, and it, we, it which was tragic. I was just, I mean, so much money was spent and we actually wrecked a really cool car for it and everything from the 50s. And so we didn't have an episode, so we plugged a uh, house call into it. And George was very gracious to uh, say some sort of Crypt Keeper-esque type of intros, which I did not write, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which were like, Ugh. Uh, but he was very, he was a trooper and did it. It was okay. And, um, um, we, we ended up getting distribution, and from what I heard, the films made, I know Chris got her money back, and and uh, the films made money for the distributors, but it's, it's, a, it's a format that I love. I love the anthology idea, 
but uh, it, it, that was a big lesson as well. Like, you, you need the happy team together. Every time you do a play or a film, it's like it's a family, and you come out the other end of it, hopefully knowing which members of that family you'd like to work with again, you know. Yeah. And it was just, uh, it was, uh, that, those were kind of difficult projects to get through just personally. Um, but I still love the format. I'd love it. I'd love to. And I ended up having, it took us so long to raise the money. Mm -hmm. um, I, I kept coming up with new ideas for stories, and I think there was some around, somewhere around 97 ideas for stories. So we could have lasted for years. And I still have like probably half a dozen scripts written that are in that you know thirty minute horror film uh, uh, format, uh, which maybe someday you know. Yeah! Wow, ninety seven stories. That's that's yeah, commitment. Yeah, was up nuts. <laughs> I thought, my God, what's wrong with you? I just kept coming up with things because it took us like three years or something to raise money. And, yeah. I, and we had was one guy we met with him like nine times, which don't ever do that. But I didn't know. <laughs> but we kept meeting with him, and like he kept like stringing us along, and like you know. But, so I just kept staying creative out of the business side of it. Uh, I just would think of locations I could get and what if this and what if that and yeah we could shoot there and what about this and so I just came up with like a whole book of like uh, log lines of uh, or, or little brief synopses Wow it, did you know that in the in 1986 there was a horror anthology movie called Dead Time Stories not until later yeah not until later because we were going to call it Chill Factor that was the original original idea of all of it and then I forget who came up with Dead Time Stories and we were like in the midst of Dead Time Stories and I found out I thought oh my goodness well, well okay, we can't use that and they were like ah now you can use it it's okay nobody ever heard of that other movie and <laughs> like so it wasn't something I was ever like entirely happy with I can't remember I think Chill Factor ended up getting shot down maybe by the distributor I can't recall but it really wasn't something that other people liked as much as I did um, and so it, we ended up you know kind of uh, doing that accidentally but you know eh. You, you could have called it Bedtime Gories. <laughs> I could have, yeah, I, I could have done that, yeah, yeah. But it was, it was something I was hoping that would, would extend and keep going, uh, and had, had it been done, I think, in a, in a different way, it could have. Um, I'm, I'm happy nobody lost money on it, but it's, it's uh, it, again, it was like one of those things that, you know, you, this is your intention with the script, and the film comes out being like, no, that's not really, really how I would have seen it. I kind of like on Sabbath Hill, which is one of the ones I directed. Um, I think it's a bit too long. We could have uh, used another edit on that, um, but some of them are just like, ooh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and Tom's, I mean Tom's, was, Tom's fit in there really well, and it's like the best of the lot by far, I think. Mm hmm. What, what do you think about the uh, the recent uh, uh, resurrection of, of horror anthology in general? I'm all for it. I mean, it's like like I said, it's it's a it's a format that I like. My idea initially with doing uh, Chill Factor was I wanted to do something where the audience could sit down, and if it's a, a ninety minute movie or uh, whatever you wouldn't know how long the story is going to be. So you could start watching it and the story would be, you know, maybe it's 30 minutes long or something like that, but it might be 10 and the next one might be 45 and then the next one's five. So it's sort of, and you wouldn't know because the story is as, uh, as long as the story is. And that turned out to be a very bad business model because what, people do what the distributors do is they they can break up the movie and sell it foreign and in uh, foreign countries they can take the movie and chop it up into like 30 minute segments and put it on television as a tv show like oh i didn't know that you know see so that you really had to stick to like the 25 to 35 minute length very much but i love uh i love that um freedom that you have with a short that it can uh kind of surprise you with that and so I love short stories and the whole town sleeping by Ray Bradbury and different um, different stories I think are just marvelous so uh, I, I'm, I'm all for uh, anthologies to continue forever yeah a film uh, maker that I know she made a, uh, a a whole horror anthology movie a couple of years ago of all 
Christmas horror stories. I thought that was very brilliant. It was called All All the All the Creatures Were Stirring or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a cool title. I love that. One of the one of the dead time stories is called Santa, which which is one of my favorites. And it was just like, what you know, what why Santa really does this, you know? <laughs> and and it, uh, it's I I I would love to make that one just even if it's not part of an anthology. But yeah, that Christmas theme always has. I mean, Christmas is very besides everything else that it is. It is a time for ghost stories, and that has a long tradition. You know, so that's that's fun. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I've tried to get Rod Serling's uh, daughter on here for the Halloween season, but she hasn't been very responsive. So fingers uh, crossed in the future, though. I'm a big Twilight yeah. Zone fan. Yeah, so Twilight Zone was just, that was something else I loved when I was growing up. And it, it's, it, it has that, it was a great theme and, and Rod Serling. And Night Gallery really wasn't as good. But Night Gallery had a couple of episodes that stuck with me. There's one with Agnes Moorhead with the shadow on the wall. That just yeah. creeped me out. I mean, I think if I saw it now, it would still creep me out. I mean, so, uh, I, uh, again, that's another uh, uh, anthology series that really worked for me. Yeah, Spielberg directed the pilot. Oh, did he? Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Was that the one with, like, Joan Crawford or something? They did, like... Yes. Like three story. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's cool. He got to be. Yeah, he got to become good friends with Joan Crawford, and he was at her funeral, too. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Spielberg. He was he was directing for TV at Universal before they uh, sent him to the movie department. You know, he directed an episode of Columbo. Uh, he did a lot of stuff uh, for for Universal in TV before the movies. Yeah. Yeah, like like Duel. I think the Duel was one of his first Duel. ones. That that was so impressive. That just blew me away when I saw that. It was just and so simple, you know. And Dennis yeah. Weaver and I think that was that a TV movie, Duel. That was a TV movie, yeah. And that was like Richard Matheson wrote it, I believe. And it's it's just uh, you know just grabs you. So glad that glad they made use of Steven Spielberg. And I think too, if I'm not mistaken, they did put it on a on a theatrical double bill with Jaws at one point. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah the truck gets the shark. Either way, it's going to get you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be fun. <laughs> so, so how long has Seventy Second Street Films been around for? Oh, I think it was formed in like 2000, the late 2009, eight seven somewhere around there and that was just something as I was I, I don't like the idea of producing I, I don't see myself as a director or a producer uh, by choice I, I like directing I like working with actors I the, the, the logistics of directing is never something I'm like thrilled over all the time I just like working with actors a lot but producing and forming uh, 72nd Street Films it was just a matter of like okay, if I'm going to do this, uh, you can't just wait for somebody to hand it to you. Try to find things that you want to do and try to make them happen. You know, I mean, Charlie yeah. Chaplin did it. You know, Buster Keaton did it. You know, Clint Eastwood does, does everybody. A lot of people since the beginning of films have decided, you know what, I'm, I mean, United Artists, the studio came out of like Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks saying, we're going to unite as artists and form our own thing. Mm-hmm. So I didn't feel too badly doing that but it's often you spend like 95 percent of your time trying to raise money um and it's a typical thing it's something george and i even talked about a lot uh, that that's what it is you just uh, george always call it the bread you need the bread man gotta raise the bread <laughs> I, had a, I had a script that i wanted to uh produce that i was going to direct and i would i would met with a guy uh who was going to give uh give us money potentially to make it and it was a horror film and i and i had a vision for it so it was something i was very very interested in directing and uh he uh, had a couple of meetings with us and he said you know go get george romero and bring him to my house and i'll give you a quarter of a million dollars to do it and I felt like, oh, real, I, I, I don't want to impose on George. Um, you know, I can't do that. And he was like, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And it was just a very awkward, strange, he had me do a Tony Robbins exercise. It was like, you know, <laughs> walk across the room with your eyes closed and don't trip. You can do it. And like, oh, what do you, it was the most demoralizing thing. But I, I thought, 
okay, this is what I have to do this. I asked George, and he's like, oh, yeah, sure. Like, really? You'll go with me to, like, oh, yeah. So I, we, I went to George's house. We jumped. He had a, I jumped in his car. He had a, a um, um, old Mercedes, and we drove to the guy's house. Mm hmm and we sat there and had a great meeting with the guy and George just, he, he, George had read the script of course and he said it was genuinely scary and he thought I would be a fabulous director for it and we were there for a good while talking to the guy and he was thrilled, the guy was thrilled to meet George and then we left and we didn't get any money. <laughs> like He just wanted to meet George. We went out to breakfast feeling like we're not gonna get any money and he says, and I felt badly about, oh, I dragged you out to this. And he was like, no, man, what? No, man, you need the bread. You got to do what you got to do. You know, that's the name of the game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure COVID put a damper on, on much of the production, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, everything is pretty much dead or it tries to come back and then it dies again because, you know, uh, somebody catches it and it, it shuts everything down. And as it you know, should. I mean, the only way we're going to get through this is by a period of really uh, conscientious safety. And we keep opening up and allowing it back in, and then it shuts down again. So hopefully, um, my target date in my mind is like June or July of next year. I'm hoping things are back to normal. So between now and then, I'm like some people like, we have to open up. We have to start working. I'm not acting. I'm not doing anything. It's like, well, you know, it's probably not going to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm casting Eric Red's uh, Bigfoot film that's uh, supposed to shoot in Wyoming. And that's, you know, on hold and things are on hold. And I'm doing little things and I'm teaching and some Zoom and some in person, but uh, always with like full safety protocol. So I think it's going to, I think it's going to be a while. So there'll probably be more writing and painting in my, in my, uh, next few months. I like to paint, um, cooking and doing other hobbies that I have. Um, mm. and I'm trying not to get too antsy acting. I, you know, I can pick up some Shakespeare and work on something and, but, um, doing a little indie project, uh, probably next week shooting, but nothing major is on the horizon until all this is blown over. And uh, you doing the uh, virtual Living Dead weekend? Yeah, I am doing that on the 7th. Uh, not the virtual, I'm doing an in-person one on the 7th um, in Monroeville at the mall. Um, oh. They asked me to do that, and I was like, well, I'm not sure, and I looked up what they were asking, and it's like masked something. I mean, they're even like using the word masks, whatever, in the in the promos for it. And so, I, well, if you're doing it safety-wise, you know, they're doing it with the... Um, you know, masks and social distancing, it's going to be different, it's going to be weird, but, you know, those things are always fun, they're, they're going to be a little bit uh, uh, less fun, perhaps, since we can't do everything that we typically do at them, but uh, that's just a one-day thing as well, so that's uh, actually a week from Saturday. Oh, I didn't realize that it was in person, because I talked to J.R. Bookwalter a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't uh, re realize, I thought it was a virtual one. Yeah, they might be doing a virtual one as well. I'm not sure. Um, but this one here is in person. They're inside the mall and outside the mall. Um, but I guess they're going to be like limiting the amount of people who can come in at a time to be where we are, you know, to, to do to do all of that. So, you know, I mean, typically you're you know putting your arms around each other for photos and shaking hands and all that. So it's going to be a little bit odd, like. I'm on this side of the table, and you're on that side of the table. You know, and it's you know it's going to be a little bit, a little bit different. But it's still nice to meet people, and it's great. Uh, it's great to be meeting people uh, who are such fans of of this because there's a lot of a lot of love there, and I can definitely relate from that's how. You know, I'm a fan. You know, I'm a fan first. I've always been a fan, and always will be. And it's uh, I know a lot of horror films don't work, and but you know there are so many great horror movies. It's nothing. Gets yeah, like a like a good horror movie, you know. So exactly. it's, it's great to meet 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 part of the tribe, you know. Exactly. Well, Jeff, I thank you so much for coming on today. I uh, hope um, uh, your shoot uh, goes very well, and uh, you get more uh, productions after all this craziness is over. Yes, yes, hoping so. But it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for having me. My pleasure, sir. You have yourself a great day. Great. Thanks. You. Uh, you too. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay.
Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Jeff Monahan, ain't he a cool dude? Uh, nice guy, great stories, remembers a lot. I enjoyed talking to him. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Till next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.